the whole families. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to um, the Haftorah for Parshat Vayikra, but it's not really for Parshat Vayikra because it's really um, in honor of Shabbat Para. Um, it is it is really interesting to me to think about which Haftorot get read with any kind of great frequency and which ones get left behind, right? I think I read recently, like we read... Um, one of the double Parsha, right? Often when Parshas are coupled together, you only read the Haftarah for the first one. And there was one recently, maybe it was around Hanukkah time, where the next time we'll read that Haftarah is like in 15 years or something, um, which is interesting, right? Like we pick this Haftarah and it doesn't get read. So normally uh, in not in a non-leap year, we wouldn't, we would be reading Vayikra's Haftarah because um, it wouldn't fall out on the Shabbatot, but this um, this year, um, Parashat Para supersedes um, our Haftarah. So um, let me just... I wonder if it has something to do with the, su the solar eclipse that we're having next week. <laughs> that would be cool. I don't think so, but we, right. we are very excited in the Keller household. We're going to Toledo, which will be a full... Yeah a full, a total eclipse spot. Make sure to take sun eye protection. Yes, we're going with my kids' school. <laughs> the whole family, all families are invited to join, so we are happily joining. Um, but they they ordered the special glasses. So. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see here. I also, I was talking to an academic friend of mine last Shabbat, and I said to her, that um, we went to a bar mitzvah at a conservative shul and they were reading the triennial cycle. And it occurred to me that I actually, I think I think that the conservative movement should create a haftorah for all of the, right? The, the haftorah of a parsha will only match one year out of three in the triennial cycle. And so I said to her, that would be like a fun project to pick haftorot for the other two years of that cycle, right? Where you only read a third of the parsha each, each week. Um, so lots of interesting things to think about when we think about which, uh, oh yes, Parshat Sav. Thank you. So embarrassing. <laughs> I'm stuck in Vayikra. Um, yeah. And this, this is this week and it is Parshat Sav. We also didn't read the Haftarah of Parshat Vayikra because it was, uh, Shabbat Zachor. And so we read about, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Agag and uh, uh, the connection to Amalek. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good catch there. Yeah. Um, Look what jumped up. Yeah, let's pick it up. Sure. And so um, this week we're reading from um, the Haftarah for Parshat Para, the connection. And I brought that little clip of Megillah again to say, right, that um, many of the Haftarot develop later, but the Haftarot for these special four Shabbatot at this time of year um, were selected in the time of the, the um, Gemara. And so here it says, especially Shit Para Aduma, right? On the third Shabbat, they read the portion of the, the red heifer uh, from um, Bamidbar for the have to, for the um uh the maftir and just to remind us that it details the purification process for one who becomes ritually impure through contact with a corpse right so someone touches a dead body um the the para aduma process is a ritual process to make you become tahor again and rashi tells us why do we read the para aduma now right we know that we read shkalim to remind us because um, in Nissan, we turn over our tax calendar, and perhaps because Haman uh, uses uh, some language about being mifuzar, being spread out and being um, estranged from each other, and the shkalim bring us together, and so it's a way to remind us of that. And then we read Amalek and Zachor because um, we say Haman is a descendant of Amalek. And so Rashi is saying, well, so now what happens? So those two are sort of preparing us for Purim, and now with the next two special parshio, we um, turn our focus towards Pesach. And so Rashi says, Lehizaher at Yisrael Taher she right why are we reading about this need to become pure right now because everyone is getting prepared to give their Pesach sacrifice and we want everyone to be ready right and so if you had come into contact with a dead body before Pesach and you're able to do this ritual then that's much better you don't have to um 
you don't have to wait until Pesach Sheni. You can you can make yourself pure at this moment. So the half Torah is an interesting choice to complement the Maftir because it talks about impurity, but the um, the real impurity is like a spiritual national impurity as opposed to a, a sort of technical personal impurity, right? In, in the in the maft here, it's really about one person, right? Yael sees someone, you know, is in the house with someone who passes away. How does she become pure to bring her Korban Pesach? And in Yechezkel, it's really much more about B'nai Israel as a whole. Um, and it's not about any one contact with a dead body, um, but it's about how we've sort of fallen from Hashem's grace is perhaps how I would say say it. Um, so the, the Haftarah opens um, with uh, with a pasuk that's sort of like a, you know, an opening pasuk of like, and this is what you should say to B'nai Israel. And then these two pasukim are really the opening, um, where again, um, Hashem talks to Yechazkel using the um, the nickname Ben Adam, right? Ben Adam, Beit Yisrael Yoshvim al, ad, uh, al Admatam, Vitam U Ota Bedar Kam Uba Alilo Tam, Ketum At Hanida Haita Dar Kam Lefanai. So he says, Ben Adam, right? Yechezkel, when the house of Israel dwelt on their own soil in Eretz Israel, they defiled it with their ways and their deeds. Their ways were in my sight like the impurity of a nida, a menstruous woman. Um, we could have done lots of interesting things tonight about nida and what that means to be a tuma like a nida. I decided I didn't really want to go in that direction. Um, one of the sort of the two biggest ways that someone can become impure is um, a woman who is in her menstrual cycle. Um, and Hashem says, "Ve'ashpoch amati alehem al hadam asher shafchu al haaretz uviglulehem tim uta um, tim uh, tim ua." Um, so I poured out my wrath, God says, on them for the blood that they shed upon their lands and for the fetishes with which they defiled. So this is not good, right? Um, this is the way in which Bnei Israel have become um, tame, right? Well, and uh, yeah, well, please. Go ahead. Um, question. I'm wondering, what's the reference to the blood that was shed up upon the land? What, what is that reference about? It's a great question. As I was rereading it right now, I was thinking that there's something about the impurity of a menstruous woman and then saying that we pour out blood, um, that maybe that is the parallel. Um, but it is probably, I would guess, maybe a reference to Sinat Chinam. I would have to look back at the original text. Um, that's my, that's my guess is that it's about Sinat Chinam. Um, and that certainly it's about, it might, it might actually be a reference to the Nida that like in some way, um, not honoring the Nida status of, right. Like be, remaining impure when they could become pure. Um, but I'm not positive. Um, and in, like, you know, I'm always tempted to just bring the whole Haftarah here. Some of the um, shirim that I, I listen to or look at do start just by reading the whole Haftarah. Um, because after this, there is a mention also of um, B'nai Israel being mitame like they had come across dead bodies. So I'm thinking, I wonder if maybe that's a piece of it too, right? This like idea of um, murder murder leading to being in the presence of dead bodies, right? But so there's two kinds of ways to sort of get into, into Tuma, uh, primary ways. And then there are actually two ways to leave um, the, the ritual impurity behind. The first is to go to the mikvah, right? Which is sort of the parallel to the Nida case, right? If you are someone who has some kind of emission that causes you to be Tame, you can go to the mikvah, right? That's sort of like your own personal action um, to be able to go to the mikvah and change your own status. And then the other kind of um, repurification is in reference to the maft here is when the Kohen, or in this case, it will be God, um, actually sprinkles the, the Mayim to harim onto the person. And that seems to be like at a, a place or a time where you yourself have no agency, right? When you go to the mikvah, you have your own agency to take yourself to the mikvah, to prepare, to go in the water, to come out. Um, and 
Um, perhaps in the cases where you have um, come in contact with a dead body, the presumption is, is that you're in such a state, perhaps of mourning or shock or despair over the person that you've lost, that you need someone else to help pull you out of that state of impurity. It would be almost um, impossible to ask someone to, to go to the mikvah on their own at that moment. And so interestingly, even though need that is the, the reference here, there does seem to be um, a sense that the way that they're going, B'nai Israel is going to leave their state of impurity is through Hashem taking that agency for them, right? Hashem says, right? That God will sprinkle, I, God, will sprinkle pure water upon you, B'nai Israel, and you shall be purified, I will purify you from all your defilement and from all of your fetishes. And then God says something super interesting, and we're going to look at it a little more closely in the Gemara. God gives us a new heart and a new spirit, a tambikirbacham that God will give uh, within us. And I will remove the heart of stone from your body, and I will give you a heart of flesh. So I think there's some amazing imagery here. Is there anything last week, right? I asked, what did it remind us from, from the Torah? And I wonder here if you have a, an image in mind, um, a reference point back to the Torah that reminds you of a heart of stone and a new heart um, in terms of the teshuva process. Can you clarify one thing? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, two paragraphs here that it mentions about the fetishes. What's it talking about? I think I think it's talking about um, poor behaviors, right? Um, you know, not not bringing korbanot, um, maybe uh, going to avodazara or uh, immodesty, right? Things that um, that God doesn't want us to do. Oh. Well, Immoral not, behaviors, maybe, is the way to say it. It's not idolatrous cults or fetishes. Mm. You're speaking so, like a psychologist. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm stuck. Maybe it's just a word. I, I was thinking of the, the golden calf or something like that. Oh. So this, it doesn't have to be that serious. Be. Interesting. I see what you're saying. I don't think so. I think it's just general bad behaviors. All right, never mind. Um, was that what was reminding you was of the golden calf? Yeah, yeah. Fetishes. I mm. I grew up in a pagan civilization in Brazil, mm. and they mm -hmm. have lots of weird things that uh, I was association with the the, the, the word fetishes, mm -hmm. like sources. Ah, I see. Hmm. I'm looking up the word while we while we think. Any other? That's interesting. What, what um, is the, what's the word in Hebrew? Yes, I, I, um, it is a uh, gilulechem, a gilul. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, gilul is idols, and so it does seem it it, it is idol worship of some sort. Okay. All right. Okay, so that's an interesting one. The golden calf, I like it. Yeah, idolatry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Rabbi Eliakim, I, I don't want to go in that direction, but yes, I think that that's right. I see that here he's saying that Nida, right, the the, the benefit of being Tumat Nida is that it's a cyclical um, situation, right? You might be set, if we imagine that Hashem and B'nai Israel are married, right, and God is the Chatan and B'nai Israel is the Kala in this case, right? And so if we are in our Tumat Nida, that's that's a piece of a, a cycle. And it it's not um it seems to be temporary, right? That's the the intention is that the Nida Tumat is temporary. And so there is some, it is perhaps a gentle way of of putting it. Um I don't, uh, the reason I don't want to go there is that I don't like when we wander down a path where uh Tumat Nida is in some way compared to sinning. Right, like tumat nida is just a thing that happens to a person, a woman's body, and so um, 
I don't love these comparisons to saying we're impure in some, right? The next thing is that God pours out his wrath on us. And so um, for being in that state of Tuma. And so that that's why I didn't want to go in that direction. But you're right. That is a beautiful sort of element of it. Um, <laughs> so I will, I will tell you that what I thought of when I was um, reading these Pesukim Kafe and Kafab was about Paro. Right, that we say that Paro's heart is hardened. And so thinking about a heart of stone and a heart of flesh, right? And when we think about um saying, right, how can Hashem harden God's Paro's heart? Don't we have uh wow. my husband just said I'm yelling? <laughs> don't, don't we have um you tell me if you can't hear me though? Don't <laughs> don't we have um don't we have agency, right? Doesn't Paro have agency? And so I think there's a question here. Um, or in here about what it means, why we would say that Hashem gives us a new heart, that Hashem removes like the hardening of our heart, right? Heart of stone to me feels like hardening. Um, so I, and you know, and to compare us to Paro is like a heavy thing to do. So I don't know exactly what to do with this comparison, but to me, there's very much an echo of Paro's experience here. Um, hmm. Yeah, please. This makes me think of modern neuroscience uh, because the latest coming out of these brain, uh, brain scan studies is that, um, well, number one, we, we create habits by doing the same thing over and over again or having the same emotional response without stopping to see if we mm. can change our emotional response. Mm. When Pharaoh's case he kept, you know, knee jerk going back mm -hmm. to the defensive stance. And the more often you do that, then so to speak, the pathways are hardened mm -hmm. and you can't get out of that trap, which is how I understand God takes over. He fashioned the body to do that for good mm -hmm. purposes. But if you use it for bad purposes, you get stuck in that. So mm -hmm. by removing the heart of stone, he's at least giving us the idea that we can change our responses and we can, we can do something different and create new responses and new pathways that with practice we can deepen. And our, our brain actually is more pliable than most of us think we can hmm. create new habits and learn new things, even in old age. That's beautiful. I like that, right? Because I think the sort of the path that you'll see that I take us down is about how this, to me, this feels like um, there's a lack of agency here. Um, but in actuality, you're saying, no, God is giving us more agency, right? And By think, removing that like calcified piece of ourselves, God is allowing us to create our own change. That's beautiful. Yeah, I'm convinced that uh, our ancestors understood these subtleties, but Without mm. the scientific language, they're expressing it in a different way. Mm. Imagery such as this. Beautiful. And I think that in any event, we can think of it as like a, a partnership, right? And as usual, I forgot that I brought this beautiful quote from Rabbi Huda Shaviv and I summarized it in my own words. So I'm not going to read it out loud now, but I think, right, that a piece of the I think the sprinkling of the water and the removing of the heart of stone are sort of one in the same in, in, the, in the, the, the idea that we are passive and they are active, although Judith is certainly pushing me to think about it in another way. Um, and in fact, in Masachat Tani, there's a really interesting um, group of psukim here. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, before, sorry, it's in Brachot that we talk about psukim. I apologize. It's been a, a post Purim haze uh, in Haftarah preparation. Um, <laughs> that there is this really interesting Gemara um, that often you learn in rabbinical school in a halachic context. Um, who talks about um, someone, uh, Rav Ada Bar Ahava, talks about someone sheyesh beyado avera, that someone has confessed for a sin. Um, right? So he's, he has a sin and he confesses to it, but he keeps doing it. Right. So like, 
you know, if I uh, were someone who liked to gossip a lot and I said, oh gosh, God, I know that I'm not supposed to do that. I'm so sorry. I will do better. And then I turn around and I share my newest piece of gossip with someone, right? Rav Adar Bar Ahava says, who is this person similar to? He says, it's like a person who holds on to a, a dead animal, someone who is ritually, a, a animal that is ritually impure, because no matter how many times you go to the mikvah while you're holding something impure, you will never become pure, right? You could go to all the waters of the world and the immersion will be ineffective for that person. Zarko miado right? The moment that you throw that animal from your hand, that then as long as you um, immerse in 40, say, ah, you don't need all the waters of the world, you'll immediately have this purifying effect. And so to me, there was like a, a similarity here, right? This idea that um, in the sprinkling, right, we're passive, but even in that space, if we have a heart of stone, we'll never become pure, right? It's like having a sheret in our hands when we try to do a tefillah. Um, and so God is saying to us, listen, if I'm going to take the trouble to, to sprinkle the water on you, the ma'im taharim, I'm going to remove the sherets first, right? I'm going to take away the thing that is stopping you from your purification process, right? And it's almost like, you know, I do like the analogy of marriage between God and the people, right? It's like a, a marriage that has gotten to a place, sort of like you, what you were saying, Judith, where like the knee-jerk instincts are so bad, right? They are so detrimental to the marriage that God is saying, listen, we've got to get rid of all the baggage before we can go to the mikvah. Because otherwise, we're not doing anything, right? We're not doing anything productive. But Israel has gotten to this point where they can't remember how to do the right thing anymore. They can't remember how to connect to Hashem. And so this is the, the way that God is going to, to, to reset us. Um, and then here, the, uh, this is what I was, was talking about before, right? Which is um, there are these uh, interesting psukim. Uh, that Rabbi Chama Bar Hanina um, talks about. Um, and he says, If we didn't have these three psukim, the legs of the enemies of Israel, a euphemism for Israel itself, would have collapsed, meaning we wouldn't be able to withstand God's judgment without these three psukim. And one of them, fascinatingly, is ours. Another one is one that we invoke on Yom Kippur. So I left them all here. Um, it's one of my my favorite um, PU team of Yom Kippur. Hine kachomer bayad hayotzer, kenatam biyadi beit Israel. Right, Yirmiyahu who says, um, "You are like clay in the potter's hand." like clay in the potter's hands, right? We are like clay in God's hands. Um, and then they quote our pasuk from Yechezkel, right? And we can tell that Rashi or someone is helping us here saying these three verses indicate that God, God influences a person's decisions. And therefore one does not have sole responsibility for his actions, right? And I think that's such a gentle way of phrasing this idea that um, it's not like God just removed our hard heart and that was it. Right, we still had to have to do the tshuva, right? Because the, the guy in the mikvah with the sherets, right, he still does the tshuva, he just hasn't done it completely, right? Mitzvah dev eno choser. He's expressed um, apologies, um, he's confessed, but he doesn't know how to repent, perhaps. And so, I think what, what um, Rabbi Chama and Rabbi Hanina adds here is this idea that it's we just couldn't live in a world of God's standards alone. Um, and so God has to give us some leniencies, some gentleness to help us um, develop in a way where we can continue on our relationship, right? Because what is the ultimate end goal for, for B'nai Israel, for Yechezkel, right, in this place is for B'nai Israel to come back to, to Israel, to, to be redeemed, to come back into the land. And it seems like God is saying, you're not going to get there on your own, <laughs> right? I, I've got to help you. Um, and the way that God is going to help us is by, by removing the heart of stone um, and giving us this new heart instead. Um, so on the one hand, there's something I think dissatisfying. And I want us to be able to, I'm a good American, right? Lift us up by our own bootstraps. I want us to get there on our own. And on the other hand, I think there's something beautiful about saying, listen, we actually, we need help, right? We can't do this alone. And God is saying, I, I see you. 
I've got you. I'm going to help you. Don't worry about it. Right. Come as a mitzvah deh. Come ready to, to confess your sins and I will help you remove the sherets. I will remove the stone so that you can fully do your teshuva. And you don't have to go to the mikvah alone. I will sort of, I will bring the mikvah to you. So I don't know what you guys think about well, it, but I, I will say, I think we take a turn. So yeah, please, Nelson. So I, I love that. I think it's just what you say. It's, uh, this is the process of tshuva. You become a new person. You drop your old heart and get a new heart. You are a new and you, you go. Yeah. Is the, the 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 brain plasticity that uh, Judy was talking about? Mm -hmm. It's I, I don't know if anyone here. Gosh, I've been talking about a lot of movies today. I don't even watch so many movies, but I don't know if you've seen um. Oh gosh, now I can't remember what it's called. The um, the sun, eternal sunshine of a oh of a spotless mind. Is that the eternal sunshine of a spotless mind? It came out oh, a long time ago. It has um Drew Carey. Is that his name? Jim Carrey. Jim, yes, thank you. <laughs> I remember the movie, yeah. <laughs> oh, amazing. And I think maybe a minute. more, I don't know, it was a long time ago. It's a beautiful movie. I highly recommend it. It sort of explores the, the, ups, the upsides and downsides of erasing your memory. In this movie, you can choose to erase someone who has hurt you in your life from your memory. But Jim Carrey's character is fighting. He, he ordered it, or maybe his girlfriend ordered it for him, and he's fighting it. He's running through his memory, trying to hold on to this woman because I, right, the premise is like, no matter how, um, how eternal your sunshine would be in your spotless mind, he wants all the, the sadness along with all the beautiful aspects of his relationship with this woman. It's a really beautiful movie. Um, but I, what I, what I, what it, this reminds me of in that case, is like, you're right, Nelson, it's beautiful. It's about Teshuvah, but like, is it too easy? Right. Like, do you have to somehow work for it? If God just sort of erases, right. All of your bad uh, instincts, and then you can just start afresh. Is it almost like that cheating won't get you anywhere or the richness of your life is somehow taken from you? I don't know. I, I'd i like to go about face. I mean, it was talking about a more materialistic approach, you know, talking about habits, but what's mm -hmm. being changed here uh, could also be just you know, what what keeps us from going the whole way and changing ourselves? Often mm. it's the belief that we can't. We're in too deep, you know, mm. we've sinned so much or, you know, mm. we, we just can't do it. In other words, we've lost a sense of hope and possibility. Mm. And where God comes in is to stimulate or revive the idea that, hey, maybe, maybe one still can change. Maybe there's mm -hmm. hope. So a more transcendental thing about emotional change, but opening the door for you so that mm -hmm. the best, you're able to take that step that you thought was impossible. You know, that you, mm -hmm. you've ruined the relationship, you can't even face the person, but maybe there is hope if if you keep trying and you know, follow God's lead and soften your approach or whatever it takes to get the person's attention and belief that you're sincere. Beautiful. Mm. That's beautiful. You've managed to redeem this text for me yet again, <laughs> which is to say, right, I think that, um, you know, Nelson and Judith working together have uh, have highlighted the the healthy pieces, right? The, the way, yeah, teamwork, exactly. The ways that you can that, that I, I like that language of finding hope, right? I think that Yechezkel um, maybe is not there, but it's a nice undertone, especially when we think about the Pesach story sort of lining up with Parshat Para. Um, we don't have the ritual of the Para anymore. So thinking about sort of other ways to help us reframe or shift, right? To help change our hearts of stone into new hearts, I think is beautiful because Right at the end of the day, whether you believe that the ashes of the para aduma helped you or not, I think we can all agree that sometimes the ritual is just uh, a 
a way of helping us through the process of change ourselves, right? And so um, without that placeholder, sometimes it's hard to remember. And so maybe reading this Haftorah can help us think about that, that piece of ourselves, right? How do we exchange our heart of stone for a heart of um, new, right? A new spirit, a new heart. How do we work with Hashem as our partner, right? How can we lean into that? It's not, um, it's not degrading to ask for help, but it's enabling. It's right. It's powerful to be able to turn to Hashem and say, help me remove that last share it. Because right. That's, I think the thing of, that it really um, takes talks to me in this Gemara that speaks to me is that the the bug is very, very small, right? Compared to the 40 seah of water, or certainly all the waters of the world, even compared to you, right? The bug is tiny, um, but it can be a real um, impediment to your teshuva, to your repurification process. And so thinking about things that we sort of downplay in our life and like, oh, that doesn't matter. That doesn't really define who I am. No, Hashem is saying it does, but let me help you. Let me remove that. So how can we sort of identify and remove those things from, from within ourselves? I think it's beautiful. I do. I want to be honest to the Haftarah and say that there, there is another piece to it, although maybe, maybe Judith and Nelson or anyone else can help us redeem this part too, right? Which is to say that Yechazkel makes it pretty clear that actually this is all for Hashem. Hashem wants to be able to say, I I have redeemed a good nation from Egypt, and, and this is a nation worthy of being redeemed, right? God says, um, his, right, right, my name has been profaned. God is saying, you made me look bad, right? As a parent, I can identify with this. Like, you can't do that. It makes it look like I didn't teach you any manners, right? Um among whom who have caused it to be profaned. And what does God care about here? And here we have a little bit of an echo of a Pesach language, right? That God redeems us from Egypt and everyone will know that God is the true God. And so I think there's something a little bit, it's transparent, right? God is saying, look, this is not about you and your new heart. It's about me and my good name. And so I have to help you change yourself so that we can look good to the rest of the world. Um, but in that process, right, even if it is for God's own motive at some level, the but I will bring you back, the kibatiatran, right? Mikohar. So Right. And at the end of the day, I think, um, does it really matter whether Hashem wants it for Hashem or Hashem wants it for us? Like we all want kibbutz galiot, right? We all want to have um, that freedom, certainly in this climate, right? To, you know, I would take being gathered in and being safe in our own lands for whichever reason God has. Um, and then Yechazkel sort of manages to turn the corner, I think, even one more time, um, because these are the concluding verses. And again, I think there's like a strong Pesach um, imagery here. Ka amar Hashem, od zot idaresh lebeit Yisrael sot lahem. Right. Moreover, in this, I will respond to the house of Israel. Sot lahem, right? And I will do it for th their sake as well. Arbe otam katzon adam. I will multiply their people like sheep. And I think that image of the sheep of the Korban Pesach, right, is, is heavy here. Um, <laughs> but also to say, right, we're about to come up to Pesach and we can imagine Jerusalem being filled to the brim with all of these sheep, right? All of these olim, it's like a very festive mood, a party. So shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of people and they shall know that I am God. And so I think that perhaps as, as much as I find this a little bit distasteful, I also, I like it, right? God is being totally honest. All of God's cards are on the table. I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to fix this up so that I can look good. But what do I really want when I look good? I want all of my people to come home and I want them to bring their korbanot and I want the streets to be filled, right, with the noise of, of my family, of my children here, right? And I think in this way, there is like a shift from spousal to parental love here, right? Come home. Come home and everything will be good and it might look good to the neighbors, but what seems like is most important in this Torah is that we'll be together again 
And that, I think Hashem is saying, that's worth removing all the stone hearts. That's worth all of the Mayim Tahorim to be able to bring all of his people, all of God's people back to Yerushalayim, to be able to give Korbanot, to have that strong relationship with God. Um, and that that's really what we're striving for on Pesach as well. And so um, it's not, I think it's not just, right, just to bring us full circle back to that Rashi, it's not just about making sure that we're pure so we can offer the Korban from like a technical standpoint. It's making sure that spiritually we're in the right place to be able to offer the Korban from a spiritual, personal, interpersonal, and not interpersonal, but interbeing, right? From us to God, from God to us, to be able to offer the Korban like without any impediments in our way. Um, and so the Haftarah is saying, okay, technically it will become pure, but also we have to figure out how to strengthen the relationship so that we can we can be there not just physically, but sort of in, in spirit and mind as well. Um, and I think it's a beautiful supplement to the maftir in that way. I'm going to stop the share so I can see everyone's faces bigger and I welcome other ideas, thoughts, questions, comments. Mm -hmm. I, I see those two passages at the end that you supplied us with. God says he's doing it for the sake of his name, but also for us because he wants us to feel that we can recover. But for the sake of my name, this isn't the only place in the Bible where that comes up. And I I take that very meaningfully to be um, God is trying to address the the, the secular argument that there's no point in trying to be good. Nice guys finish last. You know, goodness is not all it's cracked up to be. You've got mm -hmm. to look out for number one, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that inevitably as a national aspiration leads to a downward spiral and mm -hmm. spiral towards disaster. I'm studying the book of Judges with another teacher, and I'll tell you, mm -hmm. it's mind-boggling how bad things get when you get into that spiral over and over yeah. and over. Hmm. So if I think of God as goodness, as the, the tetragrammaton standing for um, kindness and mercy and, you know, the, the motherly side of God, in a certain respect, as opposed to the Elohim mm. uh, version, which is the warrior side and the, you know, mm -hmm. side. And I <clears throat> believe what sets um, the Israelites apart is their perception of that, that softer side of God, that mm. merciful side of God. And what he's saying, what God is saying to us is, you know, by spilling blood in whatever fashion that's not for the sake of God, hmm. we are turning people off from the notion that goodness can prevail. Hmm. And the, the image of all the sheep gathering in Jerusalem, that's a different kind of shedding of blood. It's for the sake mm. of God in the abstract, but it's also for the sake of feeding the the Levites and the Kohanim. Mm. Uh, and That's an interesting point, right? That also brings it full circle. It's like we yeah. have the choice of what kind of blood we wish to shed. Mm -hmm. And we had been making poor choices about it, but we could be making better choices. It does also, I think, elevate the Korbanot from like just like this physical act to a more spiritual one. Beautiful. I, I want to mention too that um, I've been an activity director with Jewish senior citizens and we sing Tumba La Laika often and uh -huh. the English in between says something about a heart full of stone and it oh. changes you know it, it's um uh, something about um, a heart full of flesh and a heart full of stone. Really? In Tumbala, 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 Laika. Huh. Wow. 
That is wild. You know what? I for a while I was looking for a song for every Haftara, but then I I ran into a few where I couldn't find one. But that would be a good one for here, right? Yeah, you should Google it and double check the lyrics. Gosh, I wonder how you spell Tumbala Laika. Oh, it comes right <laughs> oh, here up. Here it is. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. I would have to do some more research into what. But I wonder if that song is talking about the Haftorah portion. Hmm. A stone can grow. Yeah. Hmm. That's a great association. I love that. Thank you, Sherry. I'm going to have to look into it more um, to see where it comes from. And, you know, what was the... Um... Mm hmm. Hmm. I, I would love if Yechezkel made it into the Tumbala Laika story. What a song. Yeah, right. What a thing that would be. Um, but yeah, I think, right, hearts, you know, it's it reminds me of like the Tin Man looking for a heart, right? Like this is a very, I think, uh, a worldwide uh, theme, motif, right? That um, we sort of harden ourselves and get in our own way. And how can we get out of the way? How can we soften those parts of ourselves? Um, and see what is there all along, right? See, find what is there and ready to be changed. So beautiful. Well, I hope everyone has a good Shabbat. I, oh, um, this Thursday night, it's hard to believe, Purim is, has just ended, but we are starting our pre-Pesach learning. <laughs> Rabbi Ari will be teaching on the mysticism of Pesach in the rabbinic suite on Thursday at eight. Rav Hodi will teach the following week also in person. And then I will teach the last week, which will be April 11th um, on Zoom for, for everyone uh, who wishes and also people who, who don't uh, are not comfortable going into the building yet. Um, and um, I will be in town on Thursday um, and Friday in Shabbat. And I, I hope to see some of you then. And I hope everyone has a nice weekend, perhaps rainy, but also warm. Sherry and I checked the weather earlier and um, a good Shabbat. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to miss you. I'm going to Baltimore in a grandchildren mission. Oh, ah, don't take very break. nice, but I'm sorry to miss you too. It's always nice to see yeah. you in else. Uh, it'll definitely be warmer in Baltimore. That's good. <laughs> good degree. You'll have to avoid the bridge. That yeah, was really yeah, yeah. the recording. Okay,